Hi everyone, I'm Amelia Benstead with the National Parks of Boston. On behalf of the National Park Service and Boston Harbor Now, I would like to welcome you to Germs at Bay, Quarantine in the Boston Harbor Islands, the first installment of our annual Revolutionary Harbor Lecture Series. This year, Revolutionary Harbor is presented as part of the commemoration of the Boston Harbor Islands 25th anniversary as a national park and 50th anniversary as a state park. To learn more about anniversary programs, please visit our website at www.bostonharborislands.org. You can find the link in the chat. I am pleased to introduce to you Mr. Charles Vidick, author of Germs at Bay, Politics, Public Health, and American Quarantine. Over the past 20 years, Mr. Vidick has consulted with numerous experts, combing through over 50,000 pages of documents in more than 40 libraries worldwide, in search of understanding America's national quarantine policy. He has numerous publications on occupational and environmental health and served as incident commander for the US Postal Service's National Anthrax Response in 2001 and 2002. He holds SM and MCP degrees from Harvard and has received numerous White House, EPA and Postal Service awards for his environmental and anthrax response work. He currently serves on the Connecticut Council on Environmental Quality, appointed by the Speaker of the House. To learn more about Charles and his work, you can visit www.germsatbaybook.com, and that link is also in the chat. So we will save audience questions for after the presentation, but you are encouraged to type them into the Q&A section as they come to you. That can be accessed at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can also turn on subtitles by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Sean Quigley. All right, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Amelia. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Sean Quigley. Uh, I have been working for the National Parks of Boston now uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, and we are very excited in partnership with Boston Harbor now uh, to provide this presentation tonight with Charles. Um, so before we get started, uh, Charles would love to ask the audience a question. Uh, have you ever been to a quarantine island in Boston Harbor? And you should be seeing a poll coming up on your screen right now. And as you can see, the options are no, uh, Castle Island, Deer Island, Gallops Island, Rainsford Island or Spectacle Island? We'll give the folks a uh, couple minutes here to answer the question uh, and then we will begin the presentation. All right, awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that is a, definitely answers kind of coming all across the board. That's fantastic. Um, looks like we definitely had uh, the most people visiting Spectacle Island, Spectacle Island with Castle Island being a close second, but nice to see that everyone here has been to, um, or at least some folks here have been to all of the quarantine islands. Um, all right, so uh, Charles, uh, if you wanna turn your camera on, uh, we can get started here. Uh, so thank you very much again for joining us uh, and might as well, dive right in. We have a lot of really interesting questions and a lot of history to unpack. Uh, so first and foremost, um, to kind of set the, uh, you know, general terms and understandings, um, how do you define quarantine in your book and for the purposes of this presentation? Well, of course, that's the, uh, the work of nearly 20 years and 300 pages. But in short, it's good to start with Haven, Haven Emerson, who's the grand nephew of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who actually came up with the modern definition back in 1917 of all times. And it was basically that those who were infected are, are isolated and really is associated with the idea of isolation hospitals, which became the vogue in the 18, late 1870s onward. And those who are exposed, uh, but not yet infected, are those who are quarantined. That's the basic uh, modern definition of quarantine. However, uh, quarantine uh, takes on many forms based on the context and the scalability. When you're talking about one-off cases of a disease, communicable disease, uh, 
that might be where hospitals come into play. When you get into epidemics and let's talk pandemics, uh, we're talking about scalable to the size of the globe or to an entire country or to a city. And so quarantine takes on different forms uh, depending upon the context and how big the epidemic is. But I think one thing is important to understand uh, aside from the uh, current definition, which is actually obsolete in the broadest sense, uh, because really the ultimate goal is not to quarantine people, but to quarantine disease and germs. And that's the really the challenge of all homo sapiens on the planet uh, to how do we quarantine germs that really is focusing on the reservoir for disease, where it starts, ground zero, uh, as opposed to quarantine people. But let's face it, until we come to a point uh, where that is actually a reality, we're going to be looking at the problem that people are communicators of disease and therefore quarantine of people uh, still remains uh, part of the portfolio of the public health strategies to deal with communicable disease. So that's just kind of an overview <laughs> of where we're at. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so appreciate that kind of, you know, definition of quarantine right there. Um, so then also kind of as a, as a brief overview before we dive into kind of looking at various time periods um, in the general history of quarantine in, you know, Boston and Boston Harbor. Uh, your book, uh, Germs at Bay, makes it clear that the Boston Harbor Islands are central uh, to the city's historic quarantine practices. Uh, can you share a few points as to why this is? Well, historically, um, before the age of antibiotics and the age of antivirals, um, and even the age of bacteriology, before we even had the germ theory of disease, uh, diseases that were communicable, particularly smallpox and cholera, and even yellow fever, um, which no one really understood how these things were transmitted. Uh, they were dreaded diseases. And so um, if a city happened to have islands where they could put people, uh, it was always historically easier to get towns to agree to use an island than to find the town that's willing to have what was called a pest house. Hospitals was not the term of art back then. They were called pest houses. So you can imagine just by the term itself, uh, you know, it's like asking somebody, would you like a nuclear reactor built in your backyard? Uh, you know how that is. We've had a few of those in New England. Uh, it never goes over well. And so the only agreement that any of the towns in the Massachusetts Bay could arrive at was that one of the islands uh, over time uh, was acceptable and most of the time because uh, Boston either owned it or is about to buy it. Yeah, kind of almost the out of sight, out of mind aspect, right? Where it's close enough, but you're not, you know, right in the center of the town. Um, exactly. Okay, so I think that that, yeah. So I think that that really, you know, kind of sets the stage as to why the islands would have been important. So I was wondering if you could speak to quarantine practices and how they evolved over time in Boston. And really more specifically wanting to talk about the origins of Boston's maritime quarantine program in the pre-revolutionary war era, kind of how was it formed, who oversaw the daily operations, and how did these practices change right after the American Revolution? So recognize that's a lot in that question right there, so, so feel yeah. free to you know, unpack it. Yeah, that's an, a mouthful, of course, but in any case, to your point here, Sean, um, I guess you start with uh, all quarantine starts first, not by quarantine, but by an epidemic. And of course, the first one that really had an impact on Boston in, in the colonial uh, world was the uh, yellow fever epidemic of 1847. Uh, it was unprecedented because before 18, uh, 1647, all of the immigrants who were coming to Boston were coming from England, Ireland, or Scotland. And whatever diseases that they were bringing were the same old diseases that they already had in Boston. But yellow fever was new because they started doing business with Barbados and some of the islands in the Caribbean. And it was a, a very frightful situation. Um, and this was the first uh, quarantine ever practiced in America 
It lasted for two years and Governor Winthrop established it um, to control all vessels coming in. Uh, of course, the danger with all quarantines is if they're too strict, you're basically starving for lack of commerce and for the basics of food, clothing and shelter. So there was a, uh, an end to it at one point, uh, but it was the longest uh, uh, quarantine event of the 17th century and actually one of the longest in American history. Uh, the, uh, there were a number of quarantine events that happened after that, which that was an order of the governor. But after that, there were a number of uh, quarantine events that occurred because smallpox was happening almost on a 12 year cycle, uh, which was almost like a generational thing. Each um, generation would be exposed to smallpox, but then the next generation, which was really naive to the disease, uh, would be the ones who would then open the um, opportunity for smallpox to uh, re-enter uh, the colony. So in the early, uh, well, 1699, the first American quarantine law was, a, was enacted by uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, the King's Privy Council, they're really the trade advisors for the King, uh, said nay to the law. They weren't too happy about anything that interfered with commerce. Uh, now, those wily Massachusetts legislators uh, were actually a little bit better than the Privy Council. Uh, while the law was neutered, they figured out over time that the way to beat the Privy Council at its game was to actually create temporary laws. All of these laws would it be good for three or four years, and if they were ever contested, they were just temporary and they could renew them whenever they did. And, and the reality was, as a result, Massachusetts, unlike any other colony, had a method of dealing with quarantine uh, and was able to get around the, uh, the king and the uh, privy council of the king that tried to control uh, anything that would adversely affect commerce. So the wily uh, legislators of Massachusetts pulled a fast one on the king. That never fit. Uh, went too well with the uh, the king or the privy council, but they were able to pull it off. Initially in Massachusetts, the legislators were given charge of running uh, quarantine. Now that's, can you imagine uh, a state legislator today being in charge of quarantine all by himself or with a couple of them? I mean, it's, it's of course it was much smaller population back then, a couple thousand people. But still, it was uh, an example of how little uh, resources and fiscal support that were provided. Soon after that 1699 law, they gave it over to the justices of the peace that lasted for about 20 years. And then they turned it over to the, uh, the selectmen of Boston because they were really on ground zero when things happened. They recognized that they needed to get down to the level where uh, the rubber meets the road. So, the real change was when we started to get as the constant influx of more uh, immigrants from uh, Europe, particularly um, United Kingdom, the uh, move was to create islands uh, because in the early period, Castle Island was used in 1647 onwards uh, to control things, but it was run by the military. So you can imagine if the military determining whether you're sick or not, uh, you're not gonna be quite certain as to what the outcome of the event is gonna be. Although the captain of the uh, military command was also a chaplain. So he did take care of things in terms of the final resting place of the people who died, but not in terms of the uh, diagnosis of disease. In 1738, the, uh, we went from, uh, Spectacle Island, which was started in 1718 as the first quarantine station, which is a legitimate one based on not military uh, management, but actually managed by the town selectmen and staff that they put there. But in 1738, it was not working anymore. They needed more accommodations and they switched it over to Rainsford Island and created the first 
island keeper who represented the person on a day-to-day -day basis who handled quarantine matters. Anyway, these early stages were really, you could call it fits and starts in dealing with epidemics as they emerged. The real change in quarantine in uh, Massachusetts and really in America was during the Revolutionary War, if I may speak to that particular point. Yeah, please do. Yeah, the Revolutionary War, uh, Sean, was extremely important because this was one of the most unusual scenarios that you can imagine. Of course, you all know about uh, Boston and how rebellious it was, uh, not wanting to pay the stamp tax and not wanting to uh, deal with uh, you know, no taxation without representation, the intolerable laws that were put in. Um, and what you know, basically uh, the king did was he threw out the Massachusetts government and put his own men in charge. In this particular case, it was General Gage who took over as a military commander. Um, and in doing it, he destroyed Rainsford Island Quarantine Station. Now that's important because when the military came in, the British military came in, they just destroyed the Rainsford Island Quarantine Station. There were no quarantine procedures. So it turned out it was like a Trojan horse. The British brought the smallpox into Boston with their military uh, members who had, whether it was the actual uh, soldier or his wife or child, uh, and the whole war that started in America, there were two wars going on at the same time. The war we call the American Revolution, and the other war was the war against smallpox, and they were ha happening simultaneously. This was one of the great revelations of my research. Um, and it was also what made it more profound was that it was not just fighting smallpox. Uh, General Washington, after the battles of Lexington and Concord and the Battle of Bunker Hill, General Washington put uh, Boston, which is really a peninsula, a quasi island, because it was a very narrow uh, isthmus, uh, he put the whole town under quarantine, a military quarantine in this case, but it was equivalent to a, um, a, a, a medical quarantine because he did not want the British who were uh, really pox infected and were holding all kinds of uh, Bostonians um, in the city, in the town um, and not letting them out. He first demilitarized them, he took all their guns away and then he claimed he was gonna give them uh, let them out, but he stalled and stalled. And until finally the king was so fed up with his, his activities that he pulled him out and had General Howe come in. General Howe then released uh, almost a thousand uh, Boston uh, um, residents who were not loyalists across the ferry to Chelsea. And there were pox infected uh, people. They were purposely infected with smallpox so that they could infect the, the uh, rebel army, George Washington's army. Well, all of this is important because after uh, General Howe and the British evacuated, because they really didn't have any reserves left, uh, they were fighting a, a losing battle there. Um, and the um, George Washington's men were also intercepting all their supplies. What happened was when George Washington finally took over, and they had control of the, down, of the downtown of Boston, they realized that we were, the, the second war was fighting smallpox. And because Rhinesford Island was no longer a, um, uh, an island that could be used for smallpox uh, quarantine, the first time in American history that the entire town of Boston was put under quarantine for two months. And because, uh, they decided that normally you would send them to the smallpox hospital on Rainsford Island. It was the first time that a humanitarian approach was adopted where hospitals on the mainland and, and quarantine within, within one's home became acceptable. It was all through, uh, you know, what do they say? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And the result was that for the first time in American history, uh, the solution was to have a hospital within 
uh, Boston itself, and if not a hospital, then within one's own home. And it was all supported by a, a phalanx of uh, medical uh, staff that were there to support this effort. So this is a part of American history that very few realize. And in the midst of this, one of the things that struck me the most was that the Declaration of Independence was read aloud during this quarantine period. That Declaration of Independence, which came from Philadelphia, by the time it got to Boston on July 13th, roughly, the city was in quarantine. So the definition of what freedom means in America must always now be thought of within the context of what happened in that period of time where they were so-called in freedom under the Declaration of Independence, but they were all in quarantine. Uh, it's a part of the American history that few people are aware of. Wow, yeah, no, that's, that's definitely one of the things that struck me when I read your book was the, you know, thinking about the siege of Boston, you think about the Battle of Bunker Hill, you think about, you know, kind of George Washington and the continental, you know, the troops surrounding the area. And it's, it's really just like all those people stuck in this tiny, small peninsula is really, you know, just a recipe for uh, disaster when it comes to diseases like smallpox. So that was, that was something that I definitely didn't know and was, was really fascinating. Um, so moving uh, a little bit, you know, kind of after the American Revolution, um, as you talked about and kind of, you know, um, almost like crises being, you know, necessary being the mother of invention. Um, as we move kind of beyond the revolution into the 19th century, um, it is clear that the physical footprints of quarantine facilities on Boston Harbor Islands expanded drastically. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how and why the maritime quarantine program uh, continued to grow and develop or in the pre and post Civil War eras. Okay, well, that'll be a, a interesting a period of time to cover in a few minutes, but I think the big thing to understand, there were a number of factors that led to a rapid expansion of quarantine, uh, not only in Boston, but in America. Uh, it started really uh, with the, uh, the Canard Line in 1841. Uh, Mayor Chapman, Jonathan Chapman, welcomed the Canard Line as being a opportunity to connect uh, Massachusetts with the culture of Europe and England. But yet at the same time, within the next seven years of that first Canard Line, which is really a technological revolution of steamships having a massive capacity for passengers, going from maybe only a couple hundred passengers to really, uh, we're talking in the order of a thousand to thousands of passengers as, as time went on in any given vehicle. Uh, so the other thing that happened, which is very important to understand, is what went on in Europe. Uh, the Irish potato famine of the 1840s was a major factor in the diaspora of the Irish uh, population to America. And Boston being the closest port of all the colonial uh, areas, uh, uh, the colonies of, the, uh, of, of our country um, was the obvious first choice for anybody who had very little money that was trying to get to America. So what happened was this uh, was a major in, uh, infusion of people. Between 1840 and 1860, uh, 330,000 people came into Boston, and the vast majority of them remained in Boston. They didn't move east, uh, west, or north, or south. Uh, so the population of Boston went like from roughly 43,000 people in 1820 to about 250,000 people in 1870. Uh, this is a massive uh, infusion of people. Um, and just remember, uh, one thing that's really important to remember is that there was no federal immigration in the 1900s. There was no federal quarantine in the 1900s. All of these were either state or local programs. In fact, they were, when it comes to quarantine, it was a state, it was a, uh, town of Boston and then city of Boston quarantine program. So 
in a way, which leads to what we'll talk about, uh, the whole burden of disease, which is a, really a federal responsibility on a on an interstate and international commerce basis, was falling onto a very a cash-strapped uh, municipality of Boston. Um, when you had uh, this massive infusion of people, uh, the city really, first of all, did not have a water supply or sewer system uh, prior to the 1840s. It was just like uh, living in a third world country, in fact, probably worse than a third world country of today. Uh, so we're dealing with uh, very significant problems uh, with, with this expansion of population, massive expansion. I mean, this is uh, dwarfs the kinds of uh, numbers of people that are even coming to this country today through our borders. It was just unprecedented in American history. So in, because of those developments, uh, people are the carriers of disease when it comes from overseas, particularly when they're immunocompromised, they're poverty stricken and malnourished, like an enormous number of the people coming from Ireland. And so uh, this expansion really meant that uh, the resources that had to be put into this um, response to disease uh, were enormous. And so what the city tried to do to cut costs was to consolidate the services provided to the poor, to the criminals, that is those who are in prisons, uh, those who are in reform schools, and those who are sick, uh, all onto Deer Island in 1847 through 1872 uh, period. Uh, and it was a massive uh, effort to consolidate the Irish, but even worse, it was the first time in Boston history where they specifically fingered the Irish for quarantine. Uh, this was what shocked me. Um, normally you'd think that nobody would put the word in a newspaper uh, that the Irish will be quarantined. It didn't matter whether they were sick or not. All Irish went to Deer Island and were quarantined whether they were sick or not. Uh, it was, they were abom abominable uh, conditions uh, that they had to deal with. Anyway, after the uh, uh, Civil War period, um, the uh, migration from Europe continued, uh, and it wasn't necessarily the Irish at that point, but Eastern Europe uh, and the Russian Jews that started coming into this country because they also were facing some of the same problems that the Irish were, but for different reasons. Uh, some of the intolerance that was going on in, in the Russian country at that time. So massive investments uh, were being made to expand the quarantine system there. Just to give you an example, we only had 30 beds on um, Rainsford Island in 1832. But by the time all of this happened, all of this massive migration, by 1915, when the um, Public Health Service took over quarantine, there were 2,000 beds on Gallup's Island to give you a sense of how, and even that was not enough. Wow. So it gives you a sense of things. So how many how many people would have been um, on Deer Island at any given time in you know say 1850 um, for Irish immigrants? Uh, there would be as many as uh, 2,000 people on on the island uh, during that period. There were 68,000 over the 20 year period. 68,000 that were uh, actually quarantined in that period, although. Uh, there were about 3 million people who came through Boston Harbor at that time. So not everybody got quarantined, but the focus is on the Irish, which has left a long legacy of uh, distrust of government amongst the Irish, which we'll <laughs> probably talk about further. Yeah, so, and just to clarify too, this would have been any anyone coming from Ireland, right? Men, women, children, sick, yeah. healthy, didn't matter. They all had to stay at Deer Island. They all, they all went to Deer Island and they had two uh, big giant uh, quarantine shelters, one for men and one for women. All the men were forced to go to the men's and all the women with their children went the other. And the Irish rebelled at this type of behavior. They thought that in coming to America, it was a land of liberty. It was a land of welcoming people. And when they were uh, taken in like this, 
not only were they uh, uh, angered by that behavior, but what also bothered them was how they were treated. Each person who came in, their clothes were stripped off of them and burnt. And after their clothes were burnt, they covered them in a white crystalline powder uh, to clean them in a so-called disinfectant. And then after that was done, they gave them a new set of clothes. I doubt they were very good. Uh, and then set into the respective quarantine shelters. The response to it was that the Irish rioted and had food riots. And uh, it was a, a really abysmal uh, how they were treated. And this went on for a number of years. Um, and of course, some of these things were some of the reasons why ultimately the federal government saw the value in taking some kind of a role in managing these things, given what was going on. It really was a humanitarian crisis. Yeah, no, I mean, I think looking at kind of, you know, one of the quotes, I think, from your book that really struck me when you're speaking about this, right, is um, quarantine's unwritten purpose often went beyond public health influenced by concepts of class, ethnicity, entitlement dictated by the ruling class. And I, and I think, you know, what you said there, right, with combining every, every kind of, um, you know, whether it's sick, people, um, people going to different like reform schools or something like that, people that should have been, you know, maybe criminal, um, criminals that were convicted, all kind of being in that same space. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, that, that definitely sounds like obviously some terrible conditions. So would that have been, if, if my understanding is correct, it would have been um, on not only Deer Island, but also Gallup's Island as well, right? There were, there were, two, there were two quarantine houses. Could you speak a little bit to kind of how Gallup's yes. Island develops as well? Yeah, there were actually, uh, you know, over time, as we talked about, there's first Castle Island uh, from 1647 on to uh, 1718. Then there's Spectacle Island from uh, 1718 to 1738. And then you had Rainsford Island that went to 1847 when Deer Island was created because it was just that, it was just too small for the massive infusion. But then uh, what ended up happening was they realized in the late 1860s that the Deer Island was not appropriate. You can't mix the criminals and the, uh, the poor uh, and reform school students with the quarantined and they're all sharing the same hospital in the same boat to go back and forth to downtown Boston. It's a recipe for epidemics. Um, and of course that's uh, 3000 people died on Deer Island. And some of that can be attributed for the, uh, to the types of uh, mismanagement that went on. But Gallup's Island was created specifically because they realized they made a mistake they realized that you couldn't be mixing all of these various groups. The so-called untouchables, unwanted of society were all being blended together. Uh, uh, totally, uh, uh, you know, um, the word humanitarian doesn't come into the, uh, the equation in this discussion. Uh, so finally, in, in, um, what ended up happening was Gallup's Island from about eight, uh, 1867 to uh, 1872 was the support uh, site for all of those who were quarantined. They, but the two worked together because the quarantine island of Gallup's Island was being supported by the, uh, the criminal class. The criminals were retained to row the boats out to the quarantine, uh, to the vehicle, uh, the various vessels that came into the uh, harbor. So um, the actual, uh, physician who was in charge of quarantine didn't have to row. He had criminals who did it for him. Uh, and they also did the gardening for him. So there was a symbiotic relationship between the two islands for about five years uh, until finally um, the epidemic of 1872, the smallpox epidemic that forever changed public health in Boston happened in which uh, we went from 50 years of politicians running public health in Boston. And in 1872, the people said, enough is enough. We want professionals running public health. And that was the beginning of the dawn of the modern age of public health in America, really. 1872 marks the beginning of professionalism, not just in quarantine, but in public health in general. So th these are very important events because 
Boston was a microcosm of the events that were occurring across America. It had the cachet, it had the bellwether status of being the limelight, the place where people look to for advice and for what the latest trends should be. So it was a very important what happened in Boston. Yeah, no, it, it definitely, um, especially as seen through your book, you know, tracing it through the entire city's history and kind of how it started as, you know, one individual out there, then you have like politicians taking over, and then you do have public health officials really becoming involved. Um, I was wondering too, if then you could speak to kind of how, as we move out of the 1870s and into the early 1900s, um, I know that in 1915, uh, James Michael Curley, who was then the mayor of Boston, uh, reached an agreement with the U.S. Public Health Service to actually lease Gallup's Island Hospital to the federal government. Um, and this effectively, you know, transfers uh, quarantine policy and authority to the federal government. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to uh, some of the outcomes that resulted from this transition from a local to a federal quarantine program. Yeah, that was a significant event in uh, American quarantine practice. Uh, it's important to understand Mayor James Curley, probably one of the most colorful Irish mayors that Boston has ever seen. Uh, he was a man who was a, uh, a man of the Irish people. The last thing that uh, Mayor Curley was about to do was to do something that the Irish didn't like. Nobody liked quarantine. And I can tell you the Irish <laughs> went in the front of the line of the people who would be objecting to quarantine based on what we just talked about. The uh, interesting thing was the federal government starting in the 1870s began taking uh, ownership role in quarantine uh, stations along the coast. Uh, and in 1893, they officially took over quarantine and were given the charge to buy up all quarantine stations across the United States. These are basically port locations other than along the Mexico, Texas uh, border where it would have been on the land. Uh, and that was a very significant development. The federal government basically did this because uh, what's happened is in 1875, the US Supreme Court said that uh, migration uh, the control of migration was a federal responsibility, not a state responsibility. And it took another 18 years for the laws to be established. Um, and ultimately, uh, in, it took until 1928 before the US Treasury, which was responsible for the US Public Health Service, it was a subordinate branch of the US Treasury, before it merged on Gallup's Island, both the quarantine and migration, immigration controls in one location. That was all made possible by some of the things that uh, Mayor Curley did. Mayor Curley uh, also recognized that there was no fiscal interest that the city had in controlling epidemics if the federal government is going to bail you out. They thought that was going to be, you know, how can you lose? It's a, a, a no lose situation. The Irish love it. Uh, everybody who's dealing with Boston, uh, you know, fiscal problems would love it. And by the way, Boston was pretty much a bankrupt city uh, in the early 1900s uh, because they were overspending and overspending. And so it was a no brainer for them to give it over. But the outcome of this is the most interesting. Uh, the federal government in the form of the US Surgeon General made all kinds of promises about, well, we'll help you with epidemics in the future don't worry about anything. Well, within six years of that uh, purchase of Gallup's Island, uh, all of those uh, so-called promises disappeared. And what was most interesting, there's positives, obviously, the fiscal positives. The negatives were that when the federal government is in charge of quarantine and immigration, uh, they don't need to consult with state and local governments. And so what happened in 1921, there was a typhus epidemic coming in from Europe and the, and the US Surgeon General decided that the best way to deal with it was to send every vessel coming to America, whether it was going to New York, 
whether it was going to uh, Norfolk or it was going down south, they all went to Gallup's Island. Now you can imagine what the Boston uh, people thought about this and every other public health department along the Eastern seaboard. They were in uproar because talk about transparency <laughs> or the lack thereof. This was like an infuriating development. And um, the, uh, basically the US Public Health Service ate crow on that one. Uh, and they realized they had gone a little bit too far. And this remains still the challenge today between the role of state public health departments and um, the current successor to the US Public Health Service is really now the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, in terms of who's doing what with quarantine. Uh, so really um, there's a plus and a minus. Uh, fiscally, there was a plus. And from the point of view of collaboration, well, I think uh, <laughs> there's a few things that still need to be worked on. Uh, so that gives you an example of some of the challenges we've faced um, and we're still facing it, as you probably know. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, so we do have a lot of questions from the audience. Um, sure. I definitely want to get to those. But before we do, just wanted to give, you know, I think maybe uh, like two, three minute answer here. I want to give you definitely a chance a little bit yeah. to talk about your source material. Um, you know, because in the introduction to your book, you write that few American historians who have studied quarantine have skimmed its surface, you know, dissuaded by the effort required to pull together vast amounts of primary source materials scattered all over the world. I know this has been a labor of love for you. Um, it was really eye-opening for me being able to read the book. Um, so I want to give you like two, three minutes here before we get to audience questions to, to, to talk about your uh, methodology. Sure. Well, yeah, I, I should probably have my head examined. Have you spent nearly 20 years on a topic that would normally not be of any interest to anybody? Uh, but of course, you know, with the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, you know, things change and uh, my investment seems to have uh, been at the right time. And who would have thought that? But in yeah. any case, I, I will say this. Uh, I had to go to probably yeah, at least 14 to 20 different states, uh, probably eight different countries, four continents. And the archives in the order of 50 different archives, primarily in New England, but all the national archives that were relevant to the work I did. But I'd say probably the most challenging part of it, since it's all primary source material, is um, I had to invent these numbers. Uh, you know, how do you get statistics when there aren't statistics? Well, I went through every single newspaper in uh, Boston from 1701 through uh, 1800, and then an enormous number of them in the uh, 1800s in order to piece together what actually happened. Uh, and then where that wasn't enough, I had to go through every selectman's uh, minutes for every meeting they had during the 18th century uh, to piece together what might only be three paragraphs in, in the book. But because there was no data, how do you get the data? So it was <laughs> a massive investment of time. But you know what? I had a great time doing it. <laughs> yeah. No, and as a you know fellow historian, I can I can say I am very impressed with the uh, the source material that you pulled together and the data that you were able to compile. Um, you know, uh, so I want to really thank you, and I do want to give you know I know folks sure. are very curious about this subject and have a lot of questions. Yeah. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague Amelia, uh, who is going to uh, share some of those questions from the audience. Okay. All right, Charles, we have several questions from the audience. Oh, um, so to, yeah, to get us started, um, just a quick clarification. Can you clarify the term pest house? Was it pest house as in a house of pestilence? Was it, a, say that again, was it a pest house? As in a house of pestilence. Uh, it, yeah, well, it, yes, I guess you could use the house of pestilence, but they were called pest houses, which were really places where people with communicable diseases were placed um, and were really uh, uh, mainland quarantine locations in essence. But since nobody wanted a pest house, it was uh, only rarely that people would agree to have them. Uh, I will say there was a pest house 
uh, right across from where Massillon General uh, Hospital is now, where the current pizza house is right across from Mass General, that was a pest house in the 1700s. So there were pest houses, but they were um, not uh, desired and wherever possible, they tried to use the islands. Okay. Um, this is another hopefully snappy question. Um, we had a couple questions about how many people survived quarantine. Um, how did they eventually get out of quarantine? Can you speak a little to kind of the statistics there and then the process of getting through quarantine and back into normal everyday life? Well, of course, uh, the survival rates varied by uh, which century we're talking about. Uh, the, uh, I will say that in the 1872 uh, uh, smallpox epidemic where they actually forcibly put people in the city of Boston and put them out on Gallup's Island, the uh, uh, death rate for those who are on Gallup's Island uh, was about twice as great as those uh, who were actually kept at home in the city of Boston. Um, and to some extent, aside from the death rate being double, like 40% were dying as opposed to 20%, um, it was also because the people that were being sent out there often were marginal uh, in terms of their incomes and um, their standing within the society. And therefore, they may have also had a few things that made it more, uh, made it more conducive for them to get the disease other than the ill treatment on Gallup's Island. So that was an example of that, but there were um, improvements over time, but there were definitely uh, disadvantages. And, and I think the important point to keep in mind is before the age of uh, antibiotics, which is really only uh, in the order of um, 80 to 90 years ago, um, there really was not a lot that could be done in terms of uh, you know, prevention uh, or even vaccinations. Uh, vaccinations did help, um, and that was one of the things that made a big difference when vaccinations were required by the state of Massachusetts as of 1855. Uh, but if nobody uh, implemented vaccination or enforced it, or they didn't get uh, booster shots, which is another problem then, uh, then it also led to higher rates of mortality as well. So there was a lot of learning that went on, and some of it was fits and starts. You're, uh, I think you're on, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Um, so I'm going to kind of pull a couple of questions together here. Um, you already touched on this, but to what extent were early quarantine hospitals linked with fear and popular understanding? And, and during those 18th and 19th centuries in the Boston area, is popular culture aligning contagious illnesses with being either bad or immoral or less than? Uh, yes, disease was uh, very much so connected with uh, moral turpitude, uh, with uh, values uh, of people who really uh, were not of the highest moral ca caliber, uh, who perhaps were not religious, uh, they were drunkards. Uh, there was a great amount of uh, uh, connection that was made, not only by the average person, but I, even by physicians. Uh, that were uh, connecting it. And in, in fact, historically, um, if you go back even to the 17th century and 18th century, uh, religion was really considered one of the things uh, that uh, brought you to a higher standard of health. It was spiritual health. They, they uh, aligned with the health of the body. So there was definitely that uh, and those associations have continued even today with some people. Uh, but yes, that was a, a big issue. And, and as a result, uh, it was not a lot of science uh, driving that. The science of public health and the science of quarantine uh, are really a more uh, recent phenomena. That's really interesting. Can you dive a little more into those demographics of the people primarily quarantined during the 18th and 19th centuries? Is that related uh, to financial standing, property ownership, cultural well, backgrounds? Well, yeah, that, that I, I can tell you that uh, of the research that I've done, uh, 
there was not a lot of statistics that were kept other than did they live or did they die, what kind of diseases they had. However, I did go through uh, the Massachusetts uh, vital statistics records for everything, every person who got smallpox during 1872. Um, and that was a labor of love to do that. And in doing it, though, I will say uh, there was no question that the poor uh, and the disenfranchised were the ones that were actually getting more quarantine. The rich were basically getting a buy. Uh, it were the poor that were actually getting uh, the, the brunt of quarantine. There was no question that there was a, uh, a discriminatory aspect of how it was applied. I mean, the worst example, of course, is the, Brit uh, is the Irish and how the Irish were basically uh, singled out explicitly, not implicitly, explicitly. So uh, there is that, but the breakdown uh, by uh, uh, ethnic groups is not, it's not possible to break it down by ethnic group as to who was on it, but it is possible to break it down uh, by uh, the people uh, who were marginal in the 1872 epidemic where I, I was able to go into a, a real deep dive on that particular epidemic. Uh, because remember, statistics in that era, uh, we really were not, you know, in a world in which statistics was something that they they wanted to keep. In fact, a lot of what went on in quarantine was let's not tell them too much. Let's let's do so. Finding the statistics on these things was an enormous undertaking, uh, and, and even then, only certain. Um, epidemics were actually capable of being quantified as to who was affected by ethnicity or other categories. That's a really impressive deep dive into 1872. I'm very impressed. Um, that took months. <laughs> I believe it. Um, so we've had a couple of questions too about um, indigenous communities and, and their impact. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how small pox, small pox impacted indigenous communities um, and how did the early quarantine system either embrace or exclude this group of people? And then how did they perceive this system? Well, in terms of the indigenous people, the worst aspect of what happened in American history was the uh, transmission of smallpox uh, to the indigenous people of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And that was really in the period 1620 through 1666. And smallpox and uh, other diseases like yellow fever basically decimated the, Irish, the uh, indigenous population uh, of America. Uh, and so the question of quarantine really uh, didn't even come up in, in that context. There was an effort on the part of the uh, colonialists to, to try to help the Indians who had it, but because the colonials had no idea of what they were doing and how uh, infectious they were, because you can have a, uh, a case where you do not have smallpox uh, and you're asymptomatic, but you could still be carrying it, especially if you've already exposed to it in the past and no longer are susceptible to the disease. So uh, there are cases in which people might have had the best of intentions uh, in trying to help the indigenous people. And yet what they may have been doing is actually creating, uh, it was a form of, 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 of killing them uh, un unknowingly. So there were some definite problems, but in terms of quarantine, uh, we do know that some of the islands in Boston Harbor were used by the Indians for places uh, to seclude themselves in their, it, this is pre-colonial, this is before the Americans, uh, the Europeans came to, to Boston. And so some of the quarantine islands uh, were used uh, by the Indians themselves uh, for actually uh, their own purposes, but this predates the uh, uh, European uh, invasion of America. Oh, I, I had no idea, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, a moving. couple of the islands were used uh, uh, by the Indians, and um, you know, it's it it would still be uh, an interesting archaeological investigation to actually start digging up 
some of the islands, Gallops and uh, Island and, and uh, Spectacle and Rainsford in particular. Those are the three islands that may have been used by Indians for uh, seclusion themselves. Wow, that's that's really fascinating. Um, I'm gonna jump. Go, yeah, I didn't go into that in the book, but I'm telling you that because that's something that came out of my research. Yeah, well, you know, you can't fit everything in one book, unfortunately. That's right. So I'm gonna jump forwards a little um, back to the Revolutionary War era. Um, and we've got a question kind of wondering if smallpox helped to unite people who were on opposite ends of the political spectrum. So folks who were more loyalists and aligned with King George versus those who were interested in independence from Great Britain. Does the kind of common fight against smallpox unify these groups at all or does it not have an impact? Well, the, the issue of uh, unifying the loyalists with the, uh, um, which are now the Americans or the rebels, uh, it, there really was uh, very little that allowed, that did happen within Boston proper during the actual siege of Boston by General Washington, because you had the rebels uh, the, uh, and the loyalists there at the same time. The rebels were under hostage and the loyalists were there. And of course they, they uh, vamoosed out of uh, Boston when the uh, uh, General Howe left. So yes, there, there were things that went on simultaneously in that period, although none of that has ever been written in any detail as to what went on uh, because the loyalists did not uh, leave Boston proper. They left by ship and went to Nova Scotia, uh, whereas the rebels uh, uh, stayed in Boston for the two month quarantine uh, that happened there. So separate from those issues in the post revolutionary war period, uh, there was an alignment of the loyalists and the rebels um, and they and they made peace ultimately uh, during the war. Obviously, things were pretty raw, uh, and the only time there really was that opportunity was actually during that period, 1775 through March of 1776, when the siege of Boston went on. And that really has never been talked about by General Howe. He his secret diaries were published many years later, and I went through all of them to see what happened. Uh, the only thing that we can say was that Howe was into bioterrorism for sure. Um, and that was one of the most remarkable findings of my research, that uh, this was really a weaponized use of uh, smallpox by the British. Can you yeah. extrapolate a little more on, on kind of that common myth of smallpox blankets and maybe the extent to which they were used against indigenous communities? We've gotten a Couple questions about that as well. Uh, for sure, uh, yes, yeah, smallpox uh, blankets uh, were definitely an issue. Uh, that was General Amherst that, that was uh, with the French uh, uh, in Indian War back in the 1760s period. Uh, but in the context of uh, Boston proper during the American Revolution, uh, there is no question that uh, fomites, which is what a, a fomite is, anything which is a inanimate object, which might be a, a carrier of disease, uh, can transmit smallpox. And it can happen uh, potentially if it's not uh, exposed to sunlight for a goodly number of days. And there was no question that this happened within Boston proper. Um, and you, my book goes into the details of how that happened by people sharing blankets and furniture in the houses that were taken over by the British or the houses that were taken over by rebel wives that were uh, separated from their husbands and took over houses that were pox infected. There's no question that some of that actually could have happened. Um, no one can actually evidentiary wise say it did happen because uh, let's face it, we don't have laboratory methods to go back in, uh, in a time machine and go find out what happened. But there was very clear evidence that the potential for that was there. Wow. Um, all right, I wanna be cognizant of the time. We are just past eight. So we're gonna take two more questions. Um, the first is, was the leper colony in Buzzards Bay considered a quarantine site? Uh, yes, that was a quarantine site, but was independent of the uh, uh, 
actual quarantine that was being managed in Boston Harbor. That was specifically for the lepers. Uh, and it was operated for a period of time in the early 1900s. There were cases of leprosy that were brought to Gallup's Island, but because uh, of the gruesome nature of the disease, uh, that uh, Gallup's Island was not used uh, for uh, leprosy. Uh, and really a lot of what quarantine is about is about fear and dread. And so the island in uh, Buzzards Bay, uh, which is the, uh, I think one of our uh, little chat persons mentioned his name, P Penakis Island. Uh, that island has its own little history. I chose not to go into the details of that island only because it was a, a, a slight digression. But uh, in fact, uh, let's face it, I went through the details of quarantine islands through across the country. But to tell a story, you wanna tell a story with uh, personalities in a storyline. And, and so some things are best left to our conversation right now. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and our final question um, relates to the immigration, primarily, I would say, in the 19th century. Um, European immigrants coming to Boston crammed into very small ships. Does that mean that if they weren't necessarily infected with something when they're leaving their home country, that because of the conditions on the ships, they have probably contracted something by the time they arrive in the U.S.? Yes, absolutely. That's a wonderful question. That's exactly the problem that uh, the Public Health Service ultimately uh, decided to uh, solve uh, because they were incubators of disease. And in fact, I'm glad you asked that question because as of 1893, the US Public Health Service revolutionized quarantine and decided that all ships coming to America would first be inspected at the port of departure, not the port of arrival. And that revolutionized uh, communicable disease control in America and actually back flushed into Europe an entire public health system based on American standards of public health. It was revolutionary. And it's from the very question that you just asked that the American system of public health has revolutionized world public health uh, because we recognize the uh, basically uh, the tinderbox of disease that was coming uh, from these ships that were just cram packed with people. Uh, and obviously they were one of the biggest problems that we faced in the diseases that came to America. Wow, thank you so much, Charles. This has been fantastic. I think we've gotten through almost every question that was submitted, so thank you. Um, I wanna put in a plug for Charles' book, Germs at Bay. Um, if you are interested, Brittany's dropping the link in the chat if you'd like to purchase it. Um, once again, on behalf of the National Park Service and Boston Harbor Now, I would like to thank Charles Vidic for sharing his time and expertise with us and each of you for attending Revolutionary Harbor tonight. If you would like to help us further commemorate our very special park anniversary, please join us for some of our upcoming anniversary events. We have another Revolutionary Harbor program, Women on the, of the Waterfront, which is featuring some truly revolutionary leaders from around Boston Harbor's public sector. And that will be on Wednesday, March 23rd from 7 to 8.15 p.m. Our third and final installment of Revolutionary Harbor this year is Shipwrecks, a live conversation with the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources Researcher, which is on Wednesday, April 13th from 7 to 8 p.m. And finally, we have our winter wander on Pedix Island coming up. This is the first public trip to Pedix in two years. And that's coming up next week on, on Saturday, February 26th. Now, registration links are in the chat for all of these events. And please keep an eye on bostonharborislands.org calendar for more program information. Have a great night, folks. Thank you, uh, Amelia. And thank you, Sean. Thank you, Charles. <laughs>